Good morning, everybody. Sorry about your bus ride. Um, first of all, as everyone is probably going to do through this entire trial, uh, thank you for your service. This is, I know you're making sacrifices, and um, obviously this is a very serious matter. Um, one of the things I want to mention, first of all, and you've been hearing it, you'll probably hear it a hundred more times, but this process is, as Mr. Gibson said, is like a seesaw. And the issue is for you, does the mitigation, is the mitigation outweighed by the aggravation, period. And if it's outweighed by the aggravation and you're certain of it and you're sure of it, you shall recommend the death penalty for Anthony Kirkland. The objections are Thank you, Judge. One thing that you should always remember as you proceed, the guilt phase in this trial is already over. Totally over. Jurors just like yourselves, citizens of Hamilton County, eight years ago found Anthony Kirkland guilty of the purposeful murder of Cassandra Crawford, also known as Cherie, during the commission of an attempted rape. And eight years ago, they found Anthony Kirkland guilty of the purposeful murder of Cassandra Crawford during the commission of an aggravated robbery. That's Cassandra right there. Eight years ago, they found Anthony Kirkland guilty of the purposeful murder of S. McKinney during the commission of an attempted rape. And eight years ago, they found Anthony Kirkland guilty of the purposeful murder of Esme Kennedy during the commission of an aggravated robbery. That is Esme. They also found for both these murders, in the murders of Kim Yarolison and Mary Jo Newton, that he did this in the course of conduct to kill two or more people. The bottom line is this. He is a vicious serial killer. We are going to go chronologically uh, in our presentation of evidence to you, and the first one will be Cassandra or Cherie Crawford. Kirkland's trail of human destruction began with Cassandra Crawford. She was 14 years old. She lived with her grandmother in Avondale. Her mom had a bit of a drug problem. The Department of Jobs and Family Services took the three children from her and gave her to Grandma Pat Patricia Crawford. So she has custody of all three kids. They all attend school. And on the evening of May 3rd, 2006, Grandma Pat Patricia, who you're going to hear from shortly, was putting the kids to bed. It was about 10.30 p.m. Patricia asked this little 14-year-old girl to check the front door and make sure it was locked and secure. Around 11 p.m., Patricia got up, looked around, and Cherie was not in the house. Now, Cherie had some depression problems. She was on medication for it. And it was not unusual, believe it or not, it might be unusual to you, for her to leave the house and walk down to where her mother lived and stay with her for the night. Patricia t will tell you it was not very unusual for her to do that. So she was gone and Patricia got a bit worried. She tried to call her cell phone. No answer, so she assumed she was going to mom's house. That may have been the ultimate destination, but near mom's place was her friend Tanny Harmon's home. Cherie went nearby that house, called Tanya, and asked if they might go out for a little bit. Tanya said she was in bed and not going out. Right around midnight, probably walking to her mother's house on the phone with her boyfriend, Rashad Bowden, a call suddenly goes dead. That was the last time anyone heard from Cherie by her family or friends. The next day, Grandma Pat Patricia started making phone calls to see if Cherie had gone to school. She had not gone to school. She becomes frantic. Around 1.30, she calls Cincinnati Police Department and reports her missing. 
Several days later, on May 9th, some people brought the police to a severely burned body in the area. This is the this area up in here. This is by Walnut Hills High School. There's a tunnel that goes under this road right here, and there's a path that goes up along this way here. The severely burned body is right here near the base of this hotel. We would have loved to take you a, a view of the scene of this. Unfortunately, in the years that have passed, the uh, they have built uh, ramps exit and exit ramps on 71 South and North, and that is gone. The area is concrete and gravel. When they found Cherie, her front teeth were knocked out. Her cell phone and all her personal belongings were gone. And eventually police requested dental records and they positively identified that body is Cassania Crawford. There were some things police noted at the scene of the crime. She clearly had been moved down the slope. This is up in here. This is much higher than the land where the antenna is. This is this path continues all under the under the road, all the way around, and up this way. And that's where they found the body. And this goes downhill from the path. It was clear that it, there it had initially been burned up near the path and then dragged down the hill. Near the body was a four by four piece of wood with a charred end as if someone had used it to stir a fire. The body was covered with old tires and from what they could tell what was left of Cherie, her hair was in a microweave. After testing was done, it was determined that an accelerant was used on the body to assist in burning it. Gasoline, lighter fluid, um, that's what an accelerant is. Highly flammable liquid. Who was responsible for Cassandra's murder was not known until March of 2009. And as I mentioned before, Kirkland was found guilty by a jury of, of her purposeful murder later. The next two victims, Mary Jo Newton and Kimia Rollison. These next two victims, Kirkland actually pled guilty to. And you're going to hear evidence of them because they are evidence to the death specific, specification of a continuing course of conduct to kill two or more people. Again, he killed four girls in this case that you're considering in this today. They are not as young as Cassania, who was 14, and you'll hear about Esme, who was only 13. Their vulnerability doesn't come because of their age. It came from their addiction to drugs. Both of these victims have relatively similar factual backgrounds. They both had drug problems. They both were acquaintances of Kirkland, both engaged in drug use with him, both, for all intents and purposes, had really lost touch with their families. Mary Jo Newton's still smoldering body was found June 15, 2006 on Wareman Avenue on the dead end street on a vacant lot. They had a house there, it was a drug house, it was taken down and that's where she was found burned up. She was still warm and hot. Someone placed her on wood and put the body on top of it, put accelerant on it to burn her body. I'm going to show you this exhibit number 15, which you'll have back in the jury room. This here is the where Cherie was found. This is where Mary Jo's burning body was found. And that is where Kirkland lived. Some of the things they found there, um, because she had been reported missing, 
Within a couple of weeks, I identified her as Mary Jo Newton. And interestingly enough, the criminalists at the scene now thought they were dealing with a serial killer. And little did they know, Kirkland wasn't finished yet. Kimya Rollison, burned and severely decomposed body was found June 13, 2008. I apologize for the, the, these pictures, but you're going to see a lot of them. And I think the judge warned you that they're going to be disturbing, to say the least. She, Kimia had been dead about 18 months. Animals had gotten to the body. And it was also clear that she had been burned. One of the things they found when they inspected Kimia's bones was that there was a clear nick, a nick on one of her neck bones indicative of being stabbed. No one knew who she was, and authorities would not know until March of 2009. Finally, we have the aggravated murder of Esme Kenny. Like the murder of Cherie, Kirkland faces the possibility of the death penalty for this murder. He committed this aggravated murder during the commission of an aggravated robbery and attempted rape. It is Saturday, March 7, 2008. Esme was 13 years old. Just a couple months ago, she had had her birthday. You saw her home, I think, did you, other few? You saw how close they were to that reservoir. She lived in that home with her mother, Lisa, and father, Tom. That day, Tom was out shopping with his brother. So Esme was at home with her mother. They were rehabbing their kitchen at the time. And Lisa was scrubbing the floor. Um, she was scrubbing the floor to clean it because there was so much dust everywhere. And it was a beautiful day that day. It was 65 degrees for March, that's pretty good. and. Esme wanted to go out for a jog around that reservoir with her mom. She asked her for do it, but she asked her to do it. But Lisa really wanted to finish her job, and you can see it wasn't that long of a run to do that. Um, even though Esme had never done that before by herself. Lisa felt comfortable with the neighborhood and thought she could do it and would be back pretty soon. So around 3.45 that day, Lisa left for her jog. She was wearing a white top over a brown spaghetti strap top shirt. She had her watch and iPod with her. Esme left for her jog, and she was never seen again alive by her family or her, parent, or her friends. Lisa knew Esme was only going to be gone for a short time, and as she cleaned the floor, she, it was around 4.15, and she'll describe it to you. She sits bolt upright, and she had this overwhelming premonition that something was wrong. So she went outside, and to demonstrate to you how genuine her panic was, she ran outside on that road and that gravel barefoot. As she looked for Esme, this is her only child, daughter. She's a talented cello player at the School for the Creative and Performing Arts. The sad and pathetic truth is that this five foot two, 100 pound Esme had already been dragged into the woods on the other side of the reservoir by that man sitting right here. In that shorter period of time, Esme was forced to endure the most unimaginable horror any person would have to endure, and she was just 13 years old. Lisa continued to look for Esme, yelling for her. She called her husband, Tom. She called the police. 
She walked around the reservoir. At one point, she actually entered the woods that you looked down into. This is the northwest end of the reservoir here. It's wet in the road. She went into the woods here. Eskimo's body was found right there where the slope mark was. She was probably a couple hundred yards away from Eskimo, but she didn't see anything. She actually went, I think one of the, maybe the last thing you saw was a house that was just north of the reservoir. Did you see that house? And at that, at that point, it was abandoned and open. So Lisa, scared out of her wits, went into that house trying to find Esme. And it was for, it was for not, she was obviously not there. The police arrive, and they have no idea what they're dealing with. 13-year-old kid, they ask her, maybe she ran away, maybe she went to McDonald's with her friends, and Lisa assured the police that was not Esme. She was, she, she will testify that she was more, she was a very immature 13-year-old girl. They searched the house. She was nowhere to be found. It's almost unimaginable what that family was going through when they're missing their 13-year-old girl, their only child. Around Lisa then, because the police were kind of um, thinking that it was a runaway, they said if she didn't come home at midnight, call us. I mean, is that kind of a thing? And in fairness to the Cincinnati Police Department, they've changed all their protocol on missing kids like this. And it was based on this case. Lisa called friends, neighbors. They were out putting up about 9.30, or they were out putting up missing signs at places all over the neighborhood. Um, around 9.30, Officer Jenny Ernst, who was a canine officer, got a call from her mom. And she, her mom lived in that neighborhood. And she said to Jenny, have you heard about the missing little girl from the neighborhood? And Jenny said she had not. So she gets a hold, Jenny gets a hold of her partner, Anthony White, who is also a canine officer. And they stop at District 5 to get more information and they head to the reservoir. And they get out of their car, they leave the, the dogs in the cars, they get out of their car and walk around the reservoir. And when they get to the northwest corner of the building, which at this point is right here, you guys look at those trees. He was sitting on, on the ground um, against one of those trees. They see knives coming out of his pants. And they ask if he has more weapons. They search him. And they find an iPod with a pink cover. On the iPod, stenciled in metal, red, property of Esme Kenny. As Officer White started walking into the woods to see if he could find Esme, Kirkland started yelling, no, 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 don't go, that's not where I found it. I found it over the other way, trying to, to get the, the police officers off the track of Esme's body. He was asked to give his name and he responded, Anthony Palmore. They ran that name and quickly realized that there was nobody by that name. It was just a fake name he'd given. He was taken into custody in another cruiser. Then, then Jenny and her partner got their dogs out and let the dogs into the woods. It was a little after midnight on March 7, 2008, that Esme's partially burned body was found deep in the woods that you looked at today. Kirkland was put under arrest and brought in for questioning at the Cincinnati Police Homicide Division. I guess because no one else before has said this, but I'm not even going to be the one that breaks the bad news for you, but you're going to spend probably around nine hours listening to Kirkland's statement to the police. I'm not going to recap the entire statement, but I want to make a few points that I believe his statement will show you as a jury. 
Initially, he was brought in for Esme's murder. You're going to hear a killer that lies about his involvement in the murder. He lies about his name. He blames others. He eventually gets completely caught up in his lies, and, conf and he gets confronted with his inaccuracies, inaccuracies and bad facts. Then he starts to tell them what happened to Esme. You're going to hear it yourself. She was running around the reservoir, and he said they ran into each other. He strikes her. He kicks her. 220-pound man. He stomps her. These are his words. And you'll find that his words match the physical evidence. She ran into the woods with him chasing her. She tells him she won't tell if he just won't hurt her. She will do anything for him if he just doesn't hurt her, let her go. So Kirkland has this little 13-year-old girl back in that dense brush you saw today, and he has her begging for her life. So what does he do? He tries to have vaginal intercourse with this little 13-year-old girl. She tells him she's a virgin. Those are his words. And you'll hear it. And he's trying to force his penis inside of her. He has torn her vagina in an attempt to rape her. And you will see the tear when the coroner shows you their photographic evidence. He can't get inside of her. So what does he make her do? This little 13-year-old girl who is begging for her life, begging for mercy, he forces her to masturbate him with his hand. She promises she won't tell as long as he lets her go. And you know, after that, unthinkable humiliation for this little girl. He decides he can't have a witness to these crimes. And she begs and says, don't you have children? He's tr she's trying to connect with him. He decides, he, Kirkland, decides to kill her, just like he's killed so many girls before. He takes a rag out of his back pocket, he twists it up, and sitting on her from the back, very, very, very slowly strangles Esme Kenny. And the evidence is going to show that he took his time killing her, too. The coroner will tell you that she can tell from the physical appearance of her face. He describes her gagging. He describes her vomiting. He describes her digging her little fingers into the ground as he's, she's dying. And he chokes her to death, and he completed his final obscenity. We had much better evidence in the Esme case because he was apprehended so quickly. She wasn't as burned as the others. He didn't have an accelerant to burn her. And not only was his memory fresh from the, the physical evidence had not been destroyed in Esme's case, so we were able to get DNA results. And you'll hear this from the coroner's lab. Esme's DNA is on his penis, on his boxer shorts, and on his hands. The police suspected him of other murders. And you'll hear him talk about Cassania. He met her over by Walnut Hills High School. Again, we would have loved to show you the scene of that crime, but it's impossible now. He wanted to pay her for sex. It was a 14-year-old girl, offering him $20, and he kept raising it up to about $60. This is Kirkland's words. She was talking on the phone just after midnight, and he attacked her because she wouldn't consent. That matches exactly what the boyfriend said happened. He will tell you he dragged her up that hill, up that path I showed you before, and choked her to death. 
he got an accelerant, again his words, and initially burned her body on top of the path that ran through there. He used a stick to stir the fire. He said she had a microweave in her hair. He came back later and dragged her body further down that hill, then covered it with tires. He then talks about the killing of Mary Jo Newton. They did drugs together. Kirkland gets mad at her again for no reason. He strangles her from behind in his van. He takes Mary Jo's body out to Wareman Avenue. He lays out a pile of wood. These are his words, places her body on it and uses an accelerant and burns her body. He then talks about another burned body where they found the charred bones on Pulte. They were scattered all over the hillside. Again, he did drugs with this woman, Kimya. He's in a van and he sticks a knife in her neck. Remember that nick in the, nick in the nut, neck bone? He hits her in the jugular vein. He refers to it as a lucky shot and she bleeds out in the van. They tried to identify her. He knew her as Kim. He knew she was from California and ultimately detectives were able to identify her as Kim Rolison. In the beginning of this, I talked about the weighing process and although we have some idea what the defense is going to be to this and using mitigation, things change. So I'm going to confine my opening only to our mitigation. And I would suggest to you that, I'm sorry, our aggravation. I would suggest to you that the weight of this aggravation is almost incomprehensible. Thank you again for serving as jurors.